You are listening to the Reraceables podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Reraceables podcast, brought to you in part by Tillamook Ice Cream. No, not at all. But please sponsor us, Tillamook. Please, maybe <laughs> one day. Welcome to the Reraceables podcast. We've all just watched. Season 34, episode six. And I'd like to welcome in for the first time all season since our preseason rankings, Jeremy Stein. Welcome oh, to and the Gene. podcast. Uh, thank you for having me. Before we dive in, Jeremy, since we haven't had you on the podcast in a while, why don't you tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are on the season so far? I'm liking that we've gone to a location we've never gone to before with uh, mainly referencing our last episode, Jordan. Thought that was exciting. Uh, definitely saw the mega leg coming. So I like the way they're incorporating that. And I do enjoy this no non elimination leg. I think it really does raise the stakes for the different teams in a new way. And it really is like an all out kind of race. I'm still not a fan of the these incremented times that based on when you finish a leg it just doesn't feel like the amazing race I fell in love with earlier seasons but I understand if it's restriction based on COVID but I I'm liking what they're doing so you mentioned restrictions based on COVID and I think that's a good place for us to start gotta gotta say I was really really bummed out about Abby and Will me too. I think we all were. I was so, so sad to see them go. Not only because they were my number one power ranking, but they, I think, had the most fun. They have the most spirit. They are the super fans. And that was such a bummer to start the, the episode off with. I think Abby had the most contagious smile of all the racers. She really did. And there's some contagious ones in the group, but I would agree. It was funny to kind of see Phil just at the new start line with a FaceTime going on. I, I think it's 50-50 whether that was actually FaceTime happening in that moment. <laughs> it's just kind of funny. But a piece of that that stands out most to me was just looking at Abby and just seeing utter devastation on her face. I mean, come on, think about this. Like, you're a super fan and you're on the race. Like you make it through the seven layers of hell to get on the show. And then in this post COVID world, you are the ones that are, you're the ones that are, uh, have a positive test. Oh, I wanted to like throw up for them. Cause they were doing well. It wasn't just that they made through the seven layers to get on the show. They were also on the show and right. doing well. I think they would have won. Just saying. They were my top two for a reason. Yeah, Lizzie and I had them number one for a reason. Yep. Ugh, and I feel like they were they were kind of climbing. Just really devastated, but with that news, we do now all of a sudden have a non-elimination leg in which the team that comes in last in the next leg will be the one team to start in the fourth group, and they're going to be 45 minutes behind the first group. Was this the right move? I guess you have to keep the same number of episodes and the same number of legs. So I imagine this was thinking on their feet and doing the best they could. I don't know if that much thought was put into it. Maybe there was. I don't know how many people's decision this was, but I don't know. I guess I, guess I feel indifferent. I think it added stakes to coming in last because when Phil said that, you know, you're going to still make it to the next leg, then it's not like teams took their time. You could tell throughout the episode that every team did not want to be in that last group. I do think that despite it still being non-elimination for that, a di for that like 45 minute delay, I think that that adds a huge amount of stakes and really creates that drive for the rest of the teams to just not come in last. Nicole's the right move. I wish they would have let it be a surprise 
once they got to the mat. Like, I think it's, they did it this way because they had already said that there's going to be no non-elimination legs. But it would have been nice if, you know, we brought it back just for this special circumstance of, oh, we had a team drop out. You are in last. You're not eliminated. But 45 minutes after everybody else is when you leave. That I would think have, that would have been good. That would have been much better TV. I agree. So you're saying for the fairness of the game and because of the rules stated, it's so that it doesn't seem skeevy. It's like, yeah, I agree. How about how do we feel about the full uh, Phil restart? We had another lineup, another little arch. We had the world is waiting, a whole go. You in on that? You out on it? You indifferent to it? I'm out. That's the beginning of the season thing. They should be leaving at the time they got there, 12 hours later. This is another COVID thing I'm like not jazzed about. Agreed. I I feel it. Though, I mean, in this time of COVID, you know, I think it was responsible. I'm, they had to make it for TV, but the announcement to the teams that there was a COVID case. Um, so I think in this world, that is a responsible thing to do. And then I think the, I get the idea behind it is to uplift people's spirits get them excited for the race again but you said it lizzie that is a the world is waiting that is a start of the season move so i think they could have done something different i i get why they did it i don't fully agree yeah i think maybe because they did it the last season when they restarted the race after an incident with it and everything going on maybe that's what they did just have the consistency there and kind of, hey, gather everyone together. We're still in this. You're still running this. We're still doing this. We're doing the best we can. We had to eliminate Abby and Will because that's what the nature of the scheduling of the show and the, probably the rules they set out going forward when it comes to this dictates. But it's always nice to hear Phil say it. Uh, let's move on to the detour. We had step by step, another dance challenge. And letter by letter, why is there so many dance challenges? Like, is this possible that they're skewing this to these types of people, or is it just by chance, or do we like the dance challenges? I bet that what's his name? The guy that we love, Tom. No. You are obsessed with him. Oh, Boston Rob. No, no, <laughs> from last season, who did the dance and the singing. Oh, Arun. Donald oh, Arun. 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 I bet because Shout out to Arun. <laughs> of that scene, they were like, we need more dances, yeah. more dance challenges. It's too entertaining. I bet that's why there's more of them. So Arun was so bad, and but yet so entertaining, we need more. Yeah, the thing is, when you when half your cast are professional dancers, nice. you're not gonna get funny scenes like Arun. Yeah. No, like where are the stakes? The right, because you know that those teams, Aubrey and David, Louis and Michelle, Quentin and Maddie, are gonna go for that. And like I think you earlier... better pick up choreography first or second attempt. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Glenda and Lumumba, by the way, for getting that. That is like, I would say, average performance for the for difficulty that dancing. the dance was. Yeah. And it yeah. just sucks that like, it, it seems like that they're so low in scoring it when like, again, like they're up against half a cast of dancers. One thing I'll say about watching the teams that are really good at dancing dance, it's actually kind of entertaining. I'm not a big dancing with the stars or any of those kinds of shows. But like, it's nice to see Aubrey and David, Louis and Michelle, Quentin, especially Quentin and Maddie. They put on a clinic, it looked like. I, I'm going to say they probably got there, saw it once or twice, and then boom. Like, they were adding flair to it the smiles on their faces the whole time. Love them. <laughs> yes. They were performing it. Yeah, it was impressive. I'm glad I'm not the only one that, that caught that. Um, 
What do you think is the biggest challenge, though? Like going back to uh, Glenda and Lumumba, it took them like what, like seven, eight times to do this. Is the biggest challenge of this the dance? Is it you're in these costumes and you're uncomfortable? Is it the weather? Is it the embarrassment of these gentlemen have to keep playing the same song and you keep sucking? What's the biggest challenge for the average dance people like a Glenda and Lumumba? For them, it seemed like it was capturing the essence. Like one of the biggest things they were critiquing Glenda on was that it's not this, you should never jump in the dance, that it is more of a bounce. So I think it's trying to um, capture the essence because that's a note that also the judge gave in the beginning that where they weren't dancing to it, they weren't fully embodying the dance. So I think after doing this many, because Glenda Lumumba did the other dance challenge too. Um, so I think for them, they're getting this note a lot of capturing the essence and like getting everything right and then syncing up. Um, I think that's what's tough too, is they're syncing up because they also said during the dance that uh, Lumumba was waiting for signs from Glenda to do one part of the dance but then Glenda was still trying to learn the dance. So I think that's what makes it tough for them. Yeah. And I imagine like, I know for me to learn, to learn things better, I have to kind of, you know, do it my own way or put my own spin on it or think of it in my own sort of way. And I'm sure for Glenda, like the way she was going to remember those steps is kind of just naturally by like jumping more or whatever. So the way she was literally learning it was the opposite of what was supposed to happen. This is just a guess, but I imagine I, I don't know. That's something I would probably do. I know. I think it was just some people have a natural knack to pick up choreography, learn it, remember it, sequence the steps, perform it. And for Southern, so, bleh, for Southern, for some other people, it's not that easy. And then picking up those subtleties that Jeremy mentioned of like, do I look at my partner or do I look at the crowd or do I bounce or do I whatever? Like that's just on top of all, just memorizing the sequence of steps and which way do I turn and all that. So I think it's just hard for some people. I think the hardest part for me would be the added pressure of the moment and all those things that we're saying, but add on to it you screw up, you have to start over. And the, all the people that are, the, the 12 people that are standing there playing the music, oh, sorry guys, uh, all right, here we go again. And then you gotta read over. And then you screw it up again. And then you gotta read over. I feel like that's kind of an underrated thing. I also think on the other side, the cool thing about this part of the challenge, why I think it would have been an obvious more fun choice, is it's an awesome setting. You're in this, you're in Jordan, you're in this beautiful theater. Uh, outdoor theater you're dancing in these costumes you're you're dancing with swords it's always fun uh, I mean it's pretty amazing I, I think that would have been a lot more fun than say the letter by letter which uh, Michael and Marcus Emily and Molly and Derek and Claire opted for uh, so who would like to try to read the Arabic alphabet first good yeah I can roll my R's, I'll tell you that. Same here. Thank you, Spanish class. I was very proud of Derek for finally getting it. Yeah, me too. Nicole, speech therapist, what was so hard about that? He's just not coordinated. He said that. He said it was a genetic thing. He 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 sounded like he had kind of admitted defeat about it, which is why it was a genetic a great disability. Effect. Yeah, yeah. And wasn't that like I know they spent a lot of time learning it, but when they got it, didn't it say that was only their second attempt at the actual test? Yeah, they weren't there very long. None of the teams were there for many attempts. I don't think. Mm -hmm. I really felt like he was like too hung up on it like the other the other teams just like went through it and it was like not a big deal I, I feel like if he didn't like 
stop and struggle so much on it, he wouldn't draw attention to it and they would just breeze through it. I agree. I think Derek overthought it. I think this is like a either indicative of him and he's like super smart and he wants to be perfect on how he's saying each of the letters or maybe it's his experience with reality TV kind of he's thinking too much into it whereas the other teams would just ka ka nun ha ya sa sa ba jim sing like they would just fire fire boom do it the best i can do it the best i can where he was so hung up on that like come on Derek, get together roll the r like well, can I just say, too, another mental factor is not only do you have to get the pronunciation right, you don't see the word spelled out. You only, or the saying spelled out, you only see the character. And so it's not in any kind of, like, English way. Like, for us, like, looking at a letter in English, Spanish, or French, or even sometimes German, um, we could kind of understand it, but, like, reading in that kind of script... I think adds a whole other layer to not only do you have to memorize the character, you have to then memorize how it's supposed to be pronounced and then you have to know how to pronounce it. But doesn't that give you some leniency? Right? Like the, 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 what was it? The yodeling? Like you didn't have to be a perfect yodeler to pass that. I feel like that's what Derek was trying to do. Mm. You know, I feel like you just kind of had to fire them out there as best you could. And, be 70 percent right yeah. which one would you have done i, I think i danced i would have danced too i think uh i think i would have done the alphabet and josh was listening so he piped in as well via text and said alphabet as well well it's a good it's a good kind of competition between the two because they both could take a lot of time. They also could be done quickly. And they also have their unique challenges of you better to learn something in both cases and then reproduce it. I don't know. I think I would have probably ended up going with the dancing. I'd like to think some part of me would be more, let's do the fun thing. But I, I think it was a well-balanced detour, though, for sure. A thought yeah. crossed in my head. I was kind of hoping to see so any of them that did the alphabet challenge another line of thinking in in choosing that one is that it would possibly help me later as far as like reading signs or hearing people or trying to communicate with people not that you learn the entire language in the half an hour it takes you to learn just how to pronounce the alphabet but I, I don't know I was thinking it was like well maybe even if I know how to say some of these words it will help me later in this leg um so I was thinking that way a little bit too I like it. That's some advanced strategy right there. Yeah. Can we talk for a minute about Emily and Molly? They're like really good at this. Well, how about the fact that they both, obviously their story is incredible. And we've mentioned that on many of these podcasts earlier in the season and it continues to be that way, but they just become more incredible with each episode. Yeah. They're like they Both grew up Jewish, even though they are, Korean and they both uh learned Hebrew did I get did I get did I miss that did I miss something there no that's right uh, is there anything that these two have not <laughs> experienced with like to help them learn letter by letter the Arabic alphabet I mean it's incredible yeah it's insane I can't wait to see what hidden talent they have ne next week <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're crazy. I thought it was interesting with Broken Carded when you saw that for Luis and Michelle's cart, that even after it was checked and passed, that there was still the potential for it to still break. So I thought that was actually really, I thought that was really cool for the race to be like, it is called Broken Carded. But for this idea that like it it's okay for it to break after it's been approved of. So I think for someone like, you know, David, who is a helicopter mechanic and is really good with his hands, 
that's where skills like that could give you an advantage. If you take a little more time, build it a little bit better, then you'll have an easier time rolling it or you don't have to both as a team pick it up and bring it over. Mm -hmm. So I thought that with the, I thought that was a cool aspect to the roadblock. It was, and I, I wish though that that advantage would have given him and Aubrey a greater advantage in beating Lewis and Michelle and not where Lewis and Michelle had an advantage that they just so happened to come across the pit stop when they were lost earlier in the leg. And I think this goes back to kind of my not really feeling the whole each leg is just in one city. We're all there. The leg happens in this one pretty contained area. And I assume after the Abby and Will, they probably made it even more locked down than they were already locked down. Because there's no room for people to really pull away. Right? Look at look at the finishes in the pit stop. Louis and Michelle were first, Aubrey and David and Quentin and Maddie kind of came in. Uh, no, it was Quentin and Maddie and Derek and Claire that came in together. Marcus and Michael, Emily and Molly came in together. It just feels like it, there's there's no room to pull away. And maybe that leaves a great, a lesser uh, margin for error, you know, going forward and where you really can't make any mistakes and because it will cost you. But it just, yeah, it just lowers, I, the, it lowers the stakes. And I feel like I remember watching, you know, early episodes of early seasons of the amazing race and being like, Oh my God, this is an equalizer challenge. It's taking some people hours to do this. Yeah. It's like, so when we get to things that are like, would be an equalizer challenge now, it's like, well, it doesn't really matter. The stakes are so low because they're all going to just leave at the same time tomorrow. So it just kind of, I don't know. It's just, just not as, quite as impressive or as shiny as it used to be i agree because you used to be able to see teams be a day ahead of other teams yeah, yeah. and that was wild and I, I don't know if it's a COVID thing because like you said at tom they may be trying to keep things contained but i do miss that too because there's less there's less chance to after you pull ahead to hang on to that lead mm -hmm. Because it's like, what good is getting a two-hour jump ahead of second place if you're only going to leave at the same time as whoever gets first, second? And you said that maybe there's a greater or there's a lesser margin for error. But then I kind of also counter that with, I think there's less of a drive to be perfect, where it's like, oh, if we're not perfect on this, we might still leave at the same time as the team that just got out ahead of us. Whereas before it's like, oh my gosh, we have a chance to pass this team, meaning we could leave before this team. Um, yeah, and you can't, just, really make, you can't really make a two hour mistake or a four hour mistake. Mm -hmm. And that's, it, I think it's evident in the, in the results of, especially at Leg Light tonight. Although teaser for next week looks like maybe someone got a flat tire. That could set you back sometime. Depends. Yep. That's cost people the whole race before. Right. Mm -hmm. Or it could be fixed in 20 minutes and it's no big deal. Yep. Thoughts on Glenda and Lumumba at this point finishing uh, seventh? Their time is up. They should have been out this leg. It felt right. Yep. Yeah. They're on the downward. They're on the downward path. Yeah, and have been for a couple episodes now. That's a sign. That's a sign. Yeah, I think this episode kind of cinched it. We'll finish up on this. Let's. Does anybody want to start by making a prediction of what comes out of the next week? You can talk about a winner, maybe a loser, something else. I think Luis and Michelle are going to be a team to beat for sure, back-to-back -back wins. Meaning I think a lot of the other teams are going to want to really be competitive with them now. Um, so whether that means like when it comes to pairing up with them, where that plays, um, I think it takes the spotlight off Marcus and Michael a bit. 
Mm. but they could also be i think they're definitely a team that once they're motivated and once they got a groove going they could hang on to it so they could win a third time in a row i think marcus and michael are going to reclaim their spot at number one see i'm on the opposite end and not just because i'm quasi rooting against it based on power i think but I think Michael and Marcus are starting to kind of hit a little bit. It's a little bit of hiccups. Them and Emily and Molly as well. Uh, that's why they came in fifth and sixth, where two episodes ago, they could be like the runaway favorites as much as you could be a runaway favorite in the season of the race. Yeah. Lizzie, close us out with your prediction. Well, this is hopeful. But for my ranking's sake, I want to see Derek and Claire do well, finally, at something. <laughs> Out loud, I went, oh, God, when Claire stepped up to build that cart, I was like, you are not thinking of your team. I, I want to know why. Why? She, they said redemption. She needed to, like, redeem herself from the Dubai. No, she doesn't. She already no. had a chance of redemption multiple times. Why do they keep putting her? I don't know. Are so, they? Is it? I was really thinking during the show. Like, is this a strategy move to save what's his face, Eric, Eric, for like the latter half of the race? Is he great at anything? Is he really showing you any great skill? We haven't had the opportunity to see yet. Because we don't know. He's doing everything. We don't know. All we know is that he can't roll his R's. Mm -hmm. That's all we know. We can't roll his R's. We've seen him trip a lot. I think he's, he's kind of clumsy too, I think. <laughs> That's all we know. So anyway, uh, I know not, nothing we've seen is very good evidence of my hopeful prediction, but I want to see them do well because I have them ranked highly and I think they are capable of it. Uh, and I think Glenn and the Mumba are on their way out. Yeah, I think we would all agree there. And it seems like the right teams are still in it. Is that fair to say? Yeah. 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 Except for Abby and Will. Yeah. So shout out to Abby and Will. I guess we'll end with them. This totally sucks for you guys. We were all rooting for you. We all had you highly ranked. And we all thought that you guys were really enjoying it. And you kind of really see that through the TV. Uh, so that was definitely... That kind of sucked. It kind of sucked to see that. But... Who knows? Maybe some other opportunity will come up for them. Maybe not. The rankings update. Abby and Will go out. That's mine and Lizzie's first place team. So no chance of getting our number one team to be the winner. And as of right now, Jeremy's in first, Nicole's second, I'm third, and Lizzie in last. Well, that's it for us on the Re Race Wolves podcast. We'll be back next week with more from episode seven. We're now down to seven. We had no non-eliminations, but we just had one because of COVID. But we'll finally have another elimination next week. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you, Nicole, for being here tonight. And we will see you next time on the Rear Esports Podcast. <laughs>